So in the first day, we talked about some of the time that led up to or included the time directly after Stalin had been alive and Nikita Khrushchev had taken over and the space race occurred. So that's what the bell ringer was about. Uh, but today we're going to continue moving through some of the events after that. And the videos we watched, of course, involved something that happened in the 70s and 80s, which included the war in Afghanistan and also the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. So if you haven't already, make sure you submit the file that goes with that, where you had to list 10 facts and five interpretations for each. So today, we'll start by looking at some of the other modern events that occurred, including the Cuban Missile Crisis, which occurred in 1962. <clears throat> and from a Russian perspective, because remember, we're trying to look at their, their point of view in this unit in particular, the Cuban Missile Crisis began because of fairness. The, the Soviets pointed out that the United States had missiles in Turkey and also our British and French allies had nuclear weapons and they were not that far away from Russia. So the Soviets said, hey, why don't we have missiles that are close to the United States? Cuba is only 90 miles away. Fidel Castro was worried about them invading again. So why don't we make a deal to put our missiles on Cuba? This, of course, was noticed because by this point, the United States has satellites and they have aerial photographs and they can see exactly what's happening and they note that the bases are built. So before the nuclear weapons can arrive, we decide to form a blockade around the island to make sure no further ships can get in or out. But the equipment is being transported on Soviet military ships. So the question is, what happens when one of their military ships gets to one of ours? And so there are a lot of people afraid that if a shooting match started between the Soviets and the United States, it could then quickly evolve into a nuclear war. So for about 13 days, Americans and the Soviet people, well, who knows how much the Soviet Union actually told their people, but People were on the edge of their seats because they believed it would be possible for a nuclear war to happen. The American government, of course, wanted to keep people calm, but they also went to the United Nations, pointing out the fact that the Soviets were doing this to try to gather support to kick them out of Cuba. Both leaders at the time, JFK in the United States and Khrushchev in the Soviet Union, didn't want this to evolve into a nuclear war. And so eventually it was agreed that they would take their supplies, their resources out of Cuba. Secretly, the United States also agreed to withdraw some resources from Europe, but that wasn't made public. And because of that, Khrushchev, of course, ended up looking weak. They went from a strong leader, Stalin, to what now looked like a weak leader with Khrushchev. And so some of the other leadership and the military started to wonder, is this softer approach really worth it? Are we going to be able to beat the United States if we have a leader like this? So it basically meant that there was a reevaluation of the USSR's leadership. And so there are basically four results that happen because of this leadership reevaluation. One is less power was placed in one set of hands. Less power was placed in one set of hands. So all the power that you saw underneath Stalin, you'll never see that level of power again. Second is leadership will rotate between moderates and radicals. 
leadership will rotate between moderates and radicals. So Stalin will be a radical, Khrushchev is a moderate, the next guy will be more radical, and the guy after that will, will be uh, the opposite. So we keep going back and forth. No matter who's in charge, though, the third item, Eastern European revolts will be crushed. Eastern European revolts will be crushed. And that's how you knew the Soviet Union was going to collapse, because as they referenced in that video there, when they started to protest for the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the Soviets didn't respond. So that, that's how you knew the Soviet Union was kind of dying, because even just a few years before that, they would have crushed that protest from happening. And then the fourth item is that leaders would not stay in power for decades. So no longer would you see someone staying in office for 20 or 30 years. But after that Cuban Missile Crisis, there would be another event that would cause some tension between the two countries, and that would be the assassination of JFK. And why is that? Where was the assassin from? Dallas. He was from, well, it would be in Dallas, yes but he was originally from the assassin from the Soviet Union. So that became one of the problems, is the association with the Soviets made people believe that they had been behind the assassination. I'm sorry, he wasn't he wasn't born in the Soviet Union. He went there to live and to train. And so that's why they saw the connection. But anyway, President Johnson, who took over after JFK, at one point almost declared war against the Soviet Union. Now there's never been any evidence that there's any connection that he kind of acted on his own, and he was radicalized. Yes, that's true when he went over to the Soviet Union to live and train, uh, but he wasn't part of their system. He wasn't taking any orders, and he just became a disillusioned individual. But then, the last thing that I want to mention today is the Vietnam conflict. And like the Korean War, we'll talk more about this in depth later. But similar to the Korean War, the North was communist, the South was allied with the United States. And this event kind of proved the level of paranoia that existed. Vietnam, as we mentioned previously, didn't want to be controlled by anyone. They weren't, didn't want to be controlled by the French. They didn't want to be controlled by the United States, China, nor the Soviet Union. They really didn't want to have anything to do with any of them. The Soviet Union gave them resources, which they used, uh, but they had no intention of being controlled by them. But that was the belief of the United States. We believe this was all just a tangled web of control 
that was slowly taking over Asia. And so we ended up backing the French when they were trying to keep their colony there, and then we stayed even after the French left. And so similar to the war in Afghanistan, this war lasted for an extended period of time, as you see up there. It involved a large amount of resources, including over 50,000 Americans that died there. And it also involved a faraway place that most of our citizens were unfamiliar with. And so for both countries, these two events, Afghanistan for the Soviets and Vietnam for the United States, demoralized the countries, so to speak, and kind of disillusioned them. That is, made them think again about why they were exactly involved in this conflict. It wasn't really worth all of the money and lives that were lost in order to fight in either of these places. Obviously for us, it took place a little bit earlier, but it wouldn't take place for the Soviets until 1979 through 1989. And even in that video, I don't know if you caught that, they had already decided to leave in 1985, but they didn't for four more years. And that was true for us, too. President Nixon ran for office in 68, promising he would end the war in Vietnam, but it dragged on for more years. And that was the thing. It's when you give up, it looks like weakness. And so we were still committed to the idea of trying to get Vietnam to be a democracy. So that's all the notes for today. The remainder of the period you can use if you didn't get that video sheet fixed or finished up, excuse me, or the reading complete. And you can also work ahead or complete the bonus activity if you'd like.